my experience, currently I'm a personal training manager at Core Fitness in 2008, starting in 2008 to the present. I started personal training at Core Fitness in 2005, just as a regular personal training until 2008. Uh, 2000 to two, 2006 to 2008, I was a sports performance coach for Velocity Sports Performance. In 2003 to 2005, I was a physical therapy aide at Doctor's Choice Physical Therapy. So I have a wide background of training for general population, sports performance for athletes, as well as working with uh, physical therapy. My certification are as follows. I'm a, from through the National uh, Strength and Conditioning Association. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Through the National Academy of Sports Medicine, I'm a certified personal trainer. And American Heart Association, I am CPR and AED certified. All right, so my passion started in 2005 for fat loss. Uh, basically how I decided or well came about this was I went to school starting in 2003 I gained 30 pounds in my first two years at actually at that time I went to Rome University so after I came back I started training at core fitness where I am right now and majority of the general population people won fat loss as did I so I started extensive research on training nutrition and lifestyle modification for fat loss my objective as a, as a person and to fulfill my potential, I, I want to educate as many people as possible on the importance of nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle. All right, so basically my presentation going through here is going to be a step-by-step -step process that I use with every single one of my clients. So in, in the process, when we start out, they fill out a medical questionnaire, they fill out var various questions on their current uh, medical and, and background. After we after we fill out that information, we go into first thing we start is with goal setting. So goal setting. If you don't know where you are and where you want to go, then how do you know if uh, how you get there? So make your goals known and uh, make them an, uh, an known to other people. Make yourself accountable. So whether it be a family member, a friend, a trainer, tell people your goals so that they can help up help hold you accountable so we start off with setting a major goal so when setting a major goal we want to make sure that we set a goal specific and then we also set a, a deadline so an example would be I will lose 20 pounds by May 1st another example would be so that would be an aesthetic goal a performance goal maybe I will perform 10 correct push-ups by May 1st whatever goal you want just be precise and figure it out figure out exactly what you want achieve it and set the deadline. After we set our major goal, we want to make sure that we set process goals. Now process goals are goals that we set on a daily and weekly basis that lead up to achieving our major goal. So a, pro a, a sample process goal will be I will eat protein with each meal every day. I will perform two strength training and two interval training sessions per week. I will sleep seven to nine hours every night. Next we need to find motivation, something that's going to spark you, that's going to get you motivated towards uh, achieving that goal. So set a goal, set the deadline. Motivation you could use as a, a beach vacation, a special event, a school or family reunion. Um, also, some of my clients they may want to run like a 5K, do a, a, a very popular mud run. I don't know if you guys have heard the Tough Mudder or Spartan races. Those are very popular nowadays and are motivating people to train in a different way. Um, I train general population people now almost as athletes because they want to perform in a 5k or, or a mud run or also another form of motivation is join the transformation contest. Currently at our gym starting February 4th we have a transformation contest that will be 12 weeks long uh, signing up there'll be prizes at the end so it just kind of gets that accountability and gets you motivated to reach your goal. Um, after we ha we have the motivation, first thing go before we start training is we want to make sure we take measurements. So we want to take a, a full body before picture. Uh, for males, you want to make sure in, you're in shorts if you if you're comfortable being being shirtless. Um, females normally will have will have shorts and either a tank top or or a sports bra just to show where you are currently. Next, we'll take body fat measurements. So body, so body fat, fat measurements can be taken with a skin full caliper. caliper. 
You can, you can do, do a handheld Omron bioelectric uh, impedance, or the, the, the best, best way if you have you know, a facility to do it would be underwater weighing. Next, Next is circumference measurements. So circumference measurements, measuring around the chest, chest measuring around the waist, measuring around the hips, so, so on and so forth. And then last, I put this specifically last, because the body weight is not always the best way to, to judge, judge your, your performance. So if you, if you gain a little bit of muscle through strength training, and you lose, lose a little bit of fat. fat. So, so if I lost two pounds of muscle and I lost two pounds of fat, the scale, scale will stay the same. So it's not the best way to, to judge, judge your performance. performance. Body, body fat, uh, body fat is always and circumference. So what I, I always what I always tell some of my clients is, if you were 150 pounds and you looked the best you've ever imagined in your life, would the 150 pounds really matter? Would that body weight really matter at that time? And everybody's, everybody's answer to that is no. Matt, we have one question that's related to that. Um, somebody wants to know if you have a, a major goal, like you want to lose 10 or 20 pounds by a certain date, what's a reasonable amount of weight to lose weekly? And I know you just said something about weight as opposed to losing muscle fat, but can you maybe answer that? Uh, a general rule of thumb, one to two pounds per uh, week is a, is a good goal. Um, I've, I've had, had clients, client, you know, it depends, depends on how much you have, you have to lose. And, and basically, basically if you have more weight, weight to lose, lose you're going to lose that quicker. If you have less weight to lose, you're going to lose that more at, at a slower pace. So uh, always go by the percentage of your body weight that you're going to lose. So you're not, you know, I only lost, you know, five pounds. But if you weigh 125 pounds, you know, that's a, a bigger percentage of your weight loss than for somebody that's 300 pounds and needs to lose 100 pounds. So a one a one to two pound uh, benchmarker would be where you're looking for per week. Next. Oh, that that's, that's a different. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. All, right. All right. So the three essentials to your fat loss plan: nutrition, metabolic resistance training, and interval slash metabolic conditioning. Now, nutrition is always always going to be number one. You cannot out-train a terrible diet. It is not possible. You can eat 500 calories in three seconds, and it'll take you an hour in the gym to burn 500 calories. So very, very important. Number one is your nutrition. So here are some nutrition guidelines that I have every one of my clients follow. They've been tested through a nutritionist, also with my clients. All the information I get is from nutritionists. I'm not a nutritionist myself, but I teach people habits and how to eat, and basically all my knowledge comes from nutritionists. The first one will be eliminate calorie-dense drinks. So when we talk about eliminating calorie-dense drinks, we're talking about our sugary sodas, our fruit juices, alcohol. Um, preferably, you want to drink 0.5 to 0.7 times your body weight in water per day. So if you're 160 pounds, you need to drink 80 to 112 ounces each per day. I know that sounds like a, like a big number, but what I say is start where you currently are now and gradually progress and increase the amount of water that you drink every day. In the beginning, you're probably going to be running, shuttling back and forth to the bathroom, back and forth. It happens to everybody, but as your body adapts to it and it adjusts, you will go and be going to the bathroom less, less frequently than you, you know, do starting in the beginning. Also. Another uh, drink for you to have on a daily basis would be green tea. Green tea has an exorbitant amount of antioxidants that will help fight free radicals and can even help boost your metabolism for fat burning. Uh, number two, so eat protein with each meal. So when we say eat protein with each meal, we want to make sure that we're eating lean protein. So we're talking chicken, grilled chicken, uh, turkey, fish. Um, also, protein you'll find that it'll, it'll be in nuts and seeds. Beans have have good source of protein. Uh, another grain called quinoa has good protein in there as well. But make sure we have a little bit of protein uh, with each meal. Um, what this is going to do? It's also going to keep you full. So when you have protein along with carbohydrates, your insulin levels won't spike as high as they would if you had carbohydrates alone. So if you have say brown rice. With, with your lunch, lunch. you want to make, make sure you have a little bit of protein, protein in there. So, so you have a piece of chicken. chicken. What, what happens is your insulin levels will spike up high, high and they, they won't spike down low. So when our insulin levels spike up too high, high that's when our body, body, body uh, stores, stores fat. fat. 
we want, we want to keep our insulin, insulin levels as stable as possible, as possible throughout the day, the day if, if your goal is fat loss, loss which is what we're looking for here. So an example for breakfast, uh, have a few omega-3 eggs with your oatmeal. For a, for a snack, snack try uh, uh, plain Greek yogurt with crushed walnuts, walnuts and blueberries. For, for a lunch or dinner, dinner add grilled, grilled chicken or turkey or, or fish to your, to your salad. salad. For, for a late night snack, I always, I always say, have, have a friend or family member tie your hands behind your back, blindfold <laughs> you, and then lock yourself <laughs> in a cloud. Sounds, sounds pretty crazy, crazy right now, but you'll thank me when bathing suits coming around in the summer. Uh, uh, just, just a question, question here. here. Sure. What if, if you're not going to have protein with every meal, how about a protein drink? What do you a protein, protein shake is also another another thing, thing that you can use as, as well. Um, whey, whey protein, uh, just some, some things about the protein supplements that are, are in GMC and vitamin shop. shop. You, you want to get the most natural and most uh, high um, quality protein powder there is. Um, they're in, in each GNC and also in, in the vitamin shop, shop there's going to be a section that says either all natural, natural or very, very small uh, quantity, quantity of what, of what they, they have in the store, store is going to be under that all natural. natural. They're, they're going to be a little, little bit more expensive, expensive but again, again you're investing in your health, so you may want to use those as opposed to some of the other well well known brands such as like a Muscle Tech or something that you know has a lot of. Show, show in magazines, magazines but that's because they, they, they pay, pay for that. They pay for that marketing. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, you mentioned fish, lean chicken. What about beef? Can you have beef? Beef, yes. Um, beef is also good. It's not uh, rest-fed beef is, would be the best um, choice for, 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 for as far as beef. You want to make sure your, your beef is lean. There is saturated fat in beef, but uh, studies show that the saturated, saturated fat, fat um, won't, won't be detrimental, detrimental to your cholesterol unless, unless it's combined with carbohydrates. So if you say you have a, a beef burger with, with the, the, the bun and, and with, with fries uh, with, with it, the combination, combination of the carbohydrates as well as, well as the saturated fat that is in the burger is what, is what will clog your arteries and, and increase your cholesterol. So, so again, again, the grass-fed beef burger is a healthy, healthy burger. Saturated fat kind of gets like a bad rap. Um, it's, it's not, not all bad. bad. Um, it's, it's only bad, bad when, you when you combine, combine it with a, with a carbohydrate source. And, and one, one more. more. Um, this, this person works out very early in the morning at 6 a.m., doesn't eat, eat in the morning. morning. Is this detrimental, detrimental to weight loss? loss. And I'm not, I'm not sure, sure she means before, before she, she works out or after, after she works out. That's what I think she's saying before. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes and no. Um, there's a few rules of thought right now. There's some called intermittent fasting. So, so this, this is a style of, 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 of uh, fasting. fasting. So, so say if you have a 16 hour fast window, window say you sleep for eight hours, you don't obviously don't eat while you're sleeping. sleeping. And then you, you go another hours while, uh, eight, eight hours while you're awake, your first, your first meal would be at 12 or one o'clock. Then you're, you're going to have an eight, eight hour window where you have your, your nutrition. So, so what, what I say to this question is whatever works best for you. If you can go to the gym in a fasted state, Still, still perform, perform your workout, workout still have energy, that's, that's fine. If, if you're going into the gym at a fasted state and you feel like you don't have energy, energy you're, you're not getting the best you know, training, training out of your, your workouts, workouts, then I would say have a little, little bit of something, something you know, maybe a small, a small protein, protein shake, uh, maybe, maybe a protein, protein bar would be, would be a good option there, there. something that's not going to you know, sit in your stomach if you're not a person that wakes up and is hungry in the morning. And there's one more. Um, this, um, this person, person had a workout work last night, night, got home very late, late and was, was starving. starving. He, wants he wants to know, in this situation, situation would he would still tie his hands behind his back and blindfold himself, or should I be able to eat? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, with, with the, the, the um, after, after a workout, workout would be the first time, time that you want to have some, some kind of carbohydrates and protein. So even if it is at nighttime, you want to make, make sure you still get something into your system because it's going to help speed up the recovery process. So if we do strength training or we do a, a cardio workout at night, um, even though it's late at night, you still want to get something in your, in your system to start the recovery process. So when you're in the gym, you're breaking down muscle tissue. When we come back from the gym and we, we use nutrition, we help speed up the recovery process. So the answer is yes, have something, uh, some protein also as well as some carbohydrates with it. Right. So on to the next one. So eat smaller meals more often. By eating smaller meals often, you will help again keep your insulin level stable throughout the day. 
And one of the, one of the biggest factors why I recommend, recommend this is to prevent yourself from overeating at your next meal. If you go into your, into your, into your dinner starving, starving like Marvin, Marvin, you're more, more likely, likely to eat with two forks instead of one. So, so if, if we, we eat spread, spread throughout the day, a little, little bit of a uh, little, little protein, a little bit of carbohydrates, another two, three hours later, have another little bit of protein, a little bit of carbohydrates. Going into your dinner or your bigger meal, so if you have breakfast, a small snack, then a lunch. Going from breakfast to lunch, if you leave that five to six hour period, you're more likely to go into that meal hungry and more likely to overeat. Uh, next, eliminate processed foods and eat whole foods whenever possible. So switching from foods out of a box or in a bag to fresh foods is very, very important. Eating processed foods can wreak havoc on your health and increase inflammation in your body, leading to a boatload of problems down the road. Along, along with, with that, that also decreasing fat burning, burning as well. Uh, uh, stick, stick to eating lean proteins, proteins fruits and vegetables, some, some greens, uh, legumes, legumes or beans, uh, uh, nuts and seeds. seeds. A, good a good rule of thumb in the grocery, grocery store is shop on the perimeter of the, of the store. store. So, so everything, everything that's, that's going to be in the boxes, boxes that's going to be processed, most, most likely will be in the middle of your store. store. All of your uh, outside, so in your dairy, produce, meats, that, that stuff, stuff is going to be along the perimeter, perimeter of your store. store. So if you stay along, along the perimeter, you, will, you, will, you may not, not even tempt yourself to even go, go into, into the process section, section and, and be tempted tempt to get, get you know, some, some, some candy, candy or, or what, what have, have you. Um, next, next, keep a food journal. journal. So, so research, research shows, shows that if you keep a, uh, track of your nutrition by recording in a journal, journal or now that have apps, apps on your phone, you can use that as well. Anything where you're going to record what you're eating on a daily basis, that, that you eat 30% better just from doing that alone. Uh, even, even more powerful than that is having a coach, a training, training partner, friend, friend or family member, member to keep you accountable. A simple, simple act of writing down what you eat and being accountable, accountable if somebody, somebody, somebody else goes a long way. So start, so start tomorrow by writing down what you ate, what you drank, and what time you had it, and you'll find yourself already making far better food choices than before just because you're writing it down. All right, All right, next, next stay, stay on, on track 90% of the time. time. One, One of the nutritionists that I follow on, on a daily basis is the nutritionist Dr. John Barardi. And what, what he did was he came out with this compliance grid of staying on track 90% of the time. So what, what that means is, depending on how many meals you have per day, so say if you're starting off with having four, four, four meals per day, three, three main meals and maybe one putting in one snack, times that, that by seven, seven days, you'd be having 28 meals in a, in a, in a, in a, in a week period. Um, that, leaves that leaves you, percentage-wise, about two and a half to three meals that you can splurge on. Now, when we talk about a splurge meal, we don't want to talk about an all-out eat fest with no regard for women or small children. <laughs> so, so, an example of a splurge would be maybe have a glass of wine for dinner. Um, you try a piece of dessert, you eat a cheeseburger. Something, something that's going to be... A splurge, a splurge where you can still keep yourself sane, but, but not all that and all that uh, eat where you're having you know, pizza, pizza, fries, every, every carbohydrate, and every fried food on, on the menu. menu. Uh, so, so keep it small, small keep it you know, you know to something that you're, you're going to be enjoy. It. And, and I also say plan, plan out your meal. meal. So, so if you're going to be going out for dinner on a Saturday, Make sure, sure those, those days, days leading up to that, that leading up to that, that meal, you stay on track that 90% of the time so that, so that when you go into that meal, when you, when you go, go out to dinner, you don't, you don't feel guilty about it. When you splurge and you plan it out, you should, you should not feel guilty about it. it. If you, that's, that's if you've been good at the, the beginning of the week. Um, so, so last, last, so the eighth guideline is probably one of the most important. And I talk about changing a habit one at a time. So research has shown as if you change one habit per time, there's an 85% success rate. If you change just two habits at a time, there's a 33% success rate. So as you can see, just by adding one habit, there's a big percentage drop in success. Um, the making just one change per week, what I say is mastered for two weeks. So if you're going to be focusing on drinking more water, you're going to say half your body weight in water, each, each week, practice, practice that, that for two, two weeks, weeks. Make, make, sure, make sure it becomes automatic, then, then move on to your, on to your next habit. So your, so your next, next habit may be have a little, little bit of protein, protein in each meal. And following these guidelines, you can go down each one every two weeks. 
and accomplish it, and you'll be far better off than trying to change either the cold turkey and everything at once, which may work for a little while, but then what happens is we fall off and we go back down to our, to our, our, our normal ways. So change one habit at a time, do it for two weeks, really ingrain it, own that habit, and then move on to the next one. Yes. yes. Um, another question. Lean meals, are they okay to eat? Lean cuisines, like lean cuisines, smart ones. Um, some are better, are better than others. Uh, the lean, lean meals they're going to be higher in sodium. Uh, they may not have a correct. Um, and they may be higher carbs than, than what some people are looking for in fat loss. So basically, basically what the lean meals do is they control, control your portion size, size, which is good because we want to make sure that we keep our portions, you know, you know in, 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 in smaller than we normally, normally eat. Um, I say, I say if you're, you're in, in, you know, you need, you need something, something to eat, and, and you need something, something quick, quick, I would, I would say, say use that, but try, try to use, try to, try to eat as many, you know, fresh foods, foods as possible. Um, if you're, if you're not, not somebody, somebody that, that, that cooks, cooks, it may, it may be an option for you. For you. I know, uh, like, like a South Beach guy has those. those. I, I know they're a little bit better in, in meal, meal proportions. Uh, the Zone diet also has meals that they deliver to you as well. Nutrition system and, and, some and some of the other ones, ones I don't uh, I don't advocate those. Um, they're just the quality of food is just uh, it's not good and it's too processed. And the only thing with those is is they keep you with the portion size. So that's their main thing. It's not really giving you healthy food to eat. It's basically you can still eat whatever you want, but have it in smaller quantities, which works for 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 so long. But you know we're looking at your body from the inside out. So what are these foods that you're putting into your body doing on the insides? That's going to show on the outside, either down the road later on in life or in two weeks. Um, I think you're moving on to exercise on your next slide. Am I yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Someone has a question, so I'm going to wait until you're done. Okay. <laughs> move on to exercise. All right. So metabolic resistance training is um, basically strength training with the use of supersets tri-sets, quad-sets, or circuits. So a, tri a superset is basically combining two exercises done one right after the other without a rest period. A tri-set would be three exercises, quad-set would be four exercises, and I categorize anything after four exercises in a row would be considered a circuit. So when we do these supersets and we do these tri-sets and circuits, don't be, don't be bogged down by, by terms. Um, it's basically just strength training moving from one exercise to the next without a rest period, and then resting at the end, whether it be, so if you're doing a superset, you're going to perform two exercises, rest at the end. We want to make sure that your rest periods are incomplete. So when I say incomplete, is you want to go into your next set where you're still huffing and puffing a little bit. So metabolic resistance training is going to get the strength training portion as well as a cardiovascular effect. Um, uh, strength training is very important for fat loss because you're building lean muscle. So having more lean muscle will increase your metabolism. The more muscle you have, the more calories you will burn at a resting rate throughout the day. So I know if we have, you know, if there are a lot of women, you know, kind of steer away from strength training, you know, think they're going to get big and bulky. It's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, if you're strength training, you lift, you know, lift as, as heavy as you can for the for the allotted amount of reps. So if you're doing a set of 12 reps, you want to use a weight where you can be challenged by those 12 reps. You don't want to be using a weight where you can do, you know, 20 reps and stop at, at 12 and not challenging yourself. So you get yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, so talk about increasing metabolism. Next, we're going to talk about is each routine. You want to make sure you're using a total body routine. So we want to make sure that we work the back, we work the the chest. We work the shoulders, we work the legs. We're using more muscle. Um, this should be at the cornerstone for your fat loss uh, program. Uh, this type of training will also boost your EPOC. EPOC is your excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, which means recovery from your metabolism to pre-exercise level. So when we strength train, our metabolism is going to be elevated to where we're strength training. We're going to burn at calories at an elevated rate, as well as after exercise. So research has shown that you, you're going to burn calories up to 38, 38 hours afterwards at an elevated metabolism rate. We'll go, actually, 
we'll get more in, into the, the epoch when we get into the interval of metabolic conditioning. Um, next is when, when we're doing our total body strength uh, workouts, we want to make sure that we're using multi-joint exercises. So multi-joint exercises uh, incorporate multiple muscles at the same time. This will give you the most bang for your fat loss buck. So by choosing these types of exercises, you'll increase totally cal total calories burned during the workout session. Um, so the big uh, bang for your buck fat loss training exercises are going to be your squats, your deadlifts, your lunges, rows, pull-ups or pull-downs, overhead presses, and push-ups. Um, these types of exercises are extremely metabolically demanding, being that you're using more muscles at the same time. They require a lot of energy to perform, be performed. Next, we're going to talk about using incomplete rest periods, which we touched, touched upon before. So using incomplete rest periods, normally from, from a fat loss standpoint, you're going to incorporate rest periods that are going to be anywhere from 90 seconds or less, depending on, on your the rep range that you're going to be using. Again, using supersets or circuits will help increase the total calories burned. By decreasing your rest, pre, rest period, you also increase your total workout density or simply your total work performed in a given time period. So with these, with these rest periods, you're going to be pairing upper and lower body exercises to help mi minimize muscular fatigue and help increase your total work performed each session. So by decreasing our rest period, we're going to get more work in in a shorter period of time, which is another way to also progress your workout. So you don't always have to add weight to the bar. You don't as, always have to maybe do another set. By decreasing our rest period and getting the same amount of work in, in a shorter period of time, we're also progressing. Lastly, lifting tempo. So you can use a weight. You could lift it slow. You can lift it fast. Lifting a weight and lifting it slow is going to create a, a, a far different stimulus on the muscle. Um, lifting tempo is used to control and measure time of exposure to a weight in a given repetition. You can increase or decrease the total time under tension of the weight by altering the speed in which you perform the exercise. Uh, varying your lifting tempo, tempos will bring new adaptation to the working muscle, which will be beneficial for fat loss. So when you're measuring your tempo for fat loss, you don't have to overcomplicate things by counting seconds on each repetition. Um, just look at the at, and vary the speed at which you perform the lifts periodically to create a new stimulus. So when we talk about lifting tempo, so if we're doing a push-up, we're in a push-up position, we're going to lower ourselves down. On the way down, normally a train. If you have a trainer or uh, in a, in a book, it says like a four, four zero, zero one. one. Tempo. tempo. So that'd, so that'd be, be a four-second four lower, lower, zero uh, stop, stop at the, at the bottom, bottom, and then to one, one second, second to push yourself, push yourself up from the bottom position. position. So, so bearing, going, going slow on the way down, down quick, quick on the way up, where we can go, go uh, quick, quick on the way down, down slow on the way up. We can do with the pause in between. There's very a lot of ways to to increase or decrease your lifting tempo to create a far different stimulus on the muscle. Now, now if, uh, uh, before, before I move on to interval or, or metabolic conditioning, I can answer that question. Okay. okay. We have a question about exercise. This person is not a fan of exercise. She knows it's a necessity, but is there any recommendations to motivate? Anything you can recommend? Um, I would say, no, number one, I'm not going to you know, promote myself, but you use, you use a trainer. Uh, number one for accountability is you, with a trainer, you're going to have a time that you're going to be able to have to meet there. Um, Number, number one, one that's going to motivate you to get to the gym because you don't want to leave, leave the trainer hanging. Even though some clients don't, don't care, care. <laughs> but you know, you know that's, that's one, one, one motivation tool. tool. If, if you don't, uh, if having, having a trainer may not, may not be financially uh, correct, correct for you, you at, at the, the at the moment. moment. You, could you could also join a group, group class. class. So, so a group class is actually could be extremely motivating or extremely intimidating. What I say for everybody is to try it. If a group class is not for you, maybe try, try a smaller group class. Um, what you could also do is you can have a workout partner. So somebody that, that comes in with you, that's going to help you keep you accountable as well. So maybe set up with uh, somebody from work, a family member, one of your close friends that you meet at the gym that if you don't go, they're going to, you know, they're going to give you heat for not being there or, or leaving them to work out on their own. So you can you know, hire a trainer, you can take a class, or, or um, use a workout partner that'll help you keep you accountable. Hopefully, that'll that'll motivate you. Once once you have a plan and once you have something moving forward, 
and you start seeing the results, the motivation increases and you're going to want to go more and more and more. Like just for instance, right now I have a, a, a client that probably one of my biggest inspirations since I've been training anybody has lost 180 pounds. When she first came into the gym, she was petrified. She didn't want to do anything. She didn't want to use a trainer. She just wanted to come up and go on the treadmill uh, and go ahead at her own pace. Um, you know, just from, I think she actually took one of my classes and she saw, she saw, you know, what kind of different workout, how much better the training was. So I encourage trying a trainer out, uh, using a class or, you know, have somebody sit, uh, get, a, get a book, you know, um, I, I can recommend various books that have training programs in there that you can follow, take with you to the gym with your workout partner. If you, if you don't, you know, uh, there's various stuff on the internet you can you can use um, some good some bad um, so just be careful where you're getting your information from all right sorry I'm sorry we have one more question I just wanted to ask her um, you mentioned doing a total body workout does that mean it is wise to target both upper and lower body in one session, or should it be split? So this person is saying, example, yesterday he did an upper body, today he's doing legs. Is that a good approach? Uh, yes, yes and no, depending. Um, I always start off everybody with a total body session. So if you're doing upper body and you're doing a lower body in the same session, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll pair it off. So we'll do a set of push-ups, and then we'll go into a set of squats, and then we'll rest. So, so bearing, bearing upper, upper and lower, lower um, actually, actually peripheral heart, heart action, you actually burn more calories because the blood flow has to go from your upper body back down to your lower body, back to the upper body, back down to your lower body. So you actually burn more calories. Now, not, not to say that an upper and lower split won't work for fat loss, um, it may not be the best way to start out. So if you're doing an upper and lower split, you may have to add in some of these more of these interval metabolic conditioning to get, to get some of your, you know, you know to, to elevate, elevate your metabolism. metabolism. So, so if you're doing an upper body split one day, you may want to do an interval workout afterwards, which I'm going to get to in a minute. minute. Um, when, when you do your lower body session, session maybe you just do the just lower body, body session, session, maybe some, some, some light aerobic, aerobic cardio, cardio afterwards. afterwards. Um, but, but what, what I, I normally, normally, normally recommend is to start out two total body strength training sessions per week and two interval cardio sessions per week. So that's kind of like a baseline. Once, Once you start, start seeing the results, results and you want to kind of switch up things, things then you can go into an upper, upper and then a lower uh, split. split. All right, so interval slash metabolic conditioning. Uh, basically, uh, to, to sum it up, it's a period of high intensity work and a period of low intensity work. So the landmark study for interval training uh, was Tremblay et al. Impact of exercise intensity on body, body fatness and skeletal muscle metabolism. So the researchers compared 20 weeks of steady state, steady state aerobic training to 15 weeks of anaerobic interval training. So what the research showed results was the aerobic group burned a total of 28,661 calories. Now compared to the interval group who burned far less calories, 13,000. 614 calories. The the findings were were mind-boggling. What the researchers found was uh, how much sub subcutaneous fat lost. The interval group lost nine times more fat than the aerobic group, despite training five less weeks and devoting less total workout time each session. So let's go back to something I touched upon was was EPOC. So the excess post exercise oxygen con consumption. So when we do this interval training, we increase our metabolism to be burning calories at an accelerated. Basically, the, the, the higher the intensity, the more calories you're going to be burning for that time period that you have that high intensity. In the low intensity is we want to do a recovery mode. So we call it active recovery. So for instance, if we use a, a bike as the mode, we're going to increase our, our intensity by pedaling faster. We want to make sure that we use resistance with that also. So I give like a, a general rule of thumb to keep your RPMs on the bike between 80 to 100. You don't just want to go too fast without resistance because then the pedal is going to be taking your legs and you're not going to be able to get the most benefit out of it. Um, so after we, you know, we do the, our interval training workout, our metabolism is going to 
be elevated at a higher rate. Research is showing again for up to 38 hours afterwards. So you're going to be burning calories at a higher rate than you would normally if you didn't do that interval session. So one of the big things in, in the fitness industry right now is aerobic training or interval training for fat loss. Um, so as you can see, you know this this study is is and there's there's this is not the only one. This is just the main one that in our industry has has shown that interval training for fat loss is a far superior tool than aerobic training. So it also shortens up the time that you're in the gym. You work a little bit harder. Um, I also say that it's a little bit less boring because you're you're alternating between that high intensity and that low intensity. Um, but be you know it, it is it is a tougher workout. Um, and beginners can also start with interval training. It's just the intensity that you're going to use. So somebody that is more advanced can use interval training. Somebody that is just starting out can use interval training. It's just about how you set up your high intensity. So if you're doing high intensity for 30 seconds, somebody who is less advanced will take more rest period or active recovery. Um, so they may use, use 90 seconds to two minutes in that active recovery mode to re recoup. Then they go back to that 30 seconds. Somebody who is in a far better condition, um, maybe that's been training for you know a few years, has done interval training before, they can do 30 seconds and 30 seconds. So your work to time ratio is, is a one to one as opposed to a one to three or four. Um, so that one to one work to rest ratio is going to be far more demanding than a one to four right work to rest ratio. Work to rest ratio. Sorry, question. Uh, quick question. question. So, so interval, interval training, training that can be either, either if I'm not correct, um, high intensity aerobic followed by a lower intensity aerobic. Can it also be high intensity aerobic followed by weight training back to aerobic, that kind of thing? Yes, yes, you can. You can. Um, I, like I like to separate, separate it because when, when I, I, people do use this, and I have used this myself, but what I found was um, with the interval training, when you go from the intervals back to the weight training, the the weight that you're going to use for that strength training movement is going to be far less than what you would use if you were going to be doing just a strength training and then interval training at the end. So you can use this. It does work. Um, but if you're looking to, like if, if strength is one of, one of your goals, I wouldn't use this. If, if for a fat loss, you could use this if, if you know, your strength, um, um, when I'm saying strength, uh, your weight number. So if you want to be able to, to you know, squat 150 pounds, you know that may not be something that you want to use uh, intersperse the intervals with the with the strength training, but it, it can be used and it can be very effective. Thank you. All right. So next is our workout setup. So basically, what we have outlined here is one workout. So one workout normally taken between forty five minutes to sixty minutes. Um, each one of these subgroups, which I'll explain a little bit more on, is going to be for a certain period of time. So when we do our dynamic warm up, we usually do our dynamic warm up for 10 minutes. So a dynamic warm up is going to be far different than um, what most people are used to. Um, you're going to be taking your muscles and your joints through you know full range of motion, warming up the body, getting the core core temperature up, increasing the heart rate. Um, this is good, and we use uh, what's called mobility exercises for people that have tight muscles. We want to, there's specific exercises we use can, to open up the shoulders, to open up the hips for people that sit a lot during the day um, and any other tight muscles, maybe whether it be hamstrings. Basically, in this dynamic warm, we're going to cover head to toe and get your body primed and ready for training. Next is corrective exercise. So if, after our warm up, we use corrective exercises. So basically, we're going to this is where we're going to do. If you have tight muscles. Um, when we do our dynamic warm-up, these are not like static stretches that some people may do before before training. When you do static stretching, that's going to decrease uh, your muscle strength and decrease your muscle power. So we don't want to do something like that prior to training. There's also there's also um, a little bit of leeway here. If you have a muscle that is extremely tight, so I'll give for instance uh, a muscle that's extremely tight for people that have a desk job is going to be your hip flexors. The reason why your hip flexors, which is the, the front part of your hip, are going to be extremely tight is because we're seated in a, in a position. We're not extended in, in that position throughout the entire day. So you can go eight hours in a seated position, stand up, and your hip flexors are going to be extremely tight, um, which will sometimes lead to low back pain. So in our corrective exercise session, 
if your hip flexors are tight, the front, the front part of your hips, we would do a static stretch for your hip flexor, and then we would activate your glutes. So on the opposing side of the, mu on, on the, on the body of your hip is going to be your glutes. So when we have tight hip flexors, that's going to turn off the activation to our glutes. So when we do our squats and we do our lunges, and we do our deadlifts, sometimes those, the, the glute muscles that's the, that are most powerful are not activated. So in the corrective exercise portion, specific to this, to this particular client, we would do a, a static stretch of the hip flexors, and then immediately after that, we're going to do a, a glute activation exercise as far as like a glute bridge or some kind of activation exercise to, to glute to, to reawaken um, those muscles so that when we go in to do our squats, they're going to be used to the maximum of your, of your capability. Question. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but can we, we just go back a little bit? bit. Um, can you give a little more, a little more information about what interval, interval training, training, like, like another, another example, example of interval training, training just to make it clear? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. All right so, so an, an, an yeah. available, uh, uh, example of interval training. So at the bottom here I have, you can use different training modes. You use a bike, you could use a treadmill, or you can use your body weight. You can also use uh, various other tools such as, you know, kettlebells are, are a big thing now in gyms, which are very effective. Uh, some gyms have a, a T-Rex suspension system, which is basically handles that are suspended, which you can do multiple exercises on. But basically an example, I'll give you an example on a bike. So if you're uh, coming in for an interval training session, um, you're going to go onto a bike. You're going to start out with a five-minute warm-up. So we do the five-minute warm-up nice and easy to get increased core body temperature, increased uh, blood flow to the working muscles, increase the heart rate. After that five minutes is up, you're going to start your interval. So you're going to increase your resistance. You're going to do 30 seconds at a high intensity pace. So you're pedaling. I like to say you're level eight out of 10. So you're pedaling 10 out of 10 would be all out effort. You're going to start pedaling at like an eight. So a little bit more than three quarters of a speed with that resistance. You're going to do that for 30 seconds. After that 30 seconds is up, you're going to do your active recovery. So you're going to take your resistance down on the bike all the way down to nothing and, and pedal for, for 60 seconds. So this is your active recovery. You're recouping from that high intensity. After that 60 seconds is up, you're going to turn the resistance back up, increase that back up to high intensity, pedal as, as, almost as hard as you can for that your 8 out of 10 uh, on your scale, perceived exertion for that 30 seconds, and you're going to alternate that 30 high intensity with 60 low intensity. And you know you can do you know start and anywhere from starting from four rounds, or all the way up to you know I've seen people do you know 15, 20 rounds depending on your uh, fitness level. Good. Okay. All right. So next, after we you know perform our corrective exercises or activation exercises, we're going to move on to our core training. So. Core training um, often gets neglected by most people because it's done at the end of our training. So the core training for most people is going to be a weak area because one, it doesn't get trained. Two, it, it gets trained incorrectly. Um, core training example would be uh, the industry has moved more towards stabilization exercises such as planks, such as uh, side planks, uh, and and number of, of variations that you can do that help stabilize your core and and it's actually how your how your core should function so doing thousands and thousands of crunches research has shown uh, through uh, uh, dr. Stuart McGill he's kind of like the, the back guy in the fitness industry that thousands and thousands of crunches are going to be wreaking havoc on your lower back and, and your lumbar disc so the reason why this is I give an example uh, analogy of a credit card. So if you take a credit card and you bend a credit card back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, what is eventually going to happen? The credit card is going to snap. So think about that as your your vertebrae and your uh, not your vertebrae, your the discs that are in between your vertebrae and your in your lumbar spine, your lower back, or your or your cervical spine, which is your neck. After so many crunches, so many crunches, so many crunches, the uh, disc is becoming be going to become weaker going to become weaker and weaker until someday, you know, hopefully not, you know, you, her you herniate a disc or you have a, bul a bulging disc in, in your back. So a lot of, a lot of um, lower back problems can be attributed to doing lots and lots and lots of crunches. Um, also with that is any kind of rotational movements 
where you're separating your upper body from your lower body. So we can do, uh, say, if you're seated, um, it's called a Russian twist. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this exercise, where you're seated, you take a medicine ball you're holding, um, you lean back slightly, and you're going from side to side, turning your upper body while, you're, while your lower body or your hips are anchored in position. So you're separating your upper body is moving, your lower body is not moving. In that position is going to be very, very detrimental to your to your spine. So the exercises that you're going to want to use for your core training are stabilization exercises such as planks, such as side planks. Um, other exercises are you know anti rotation or any kind of anti extension, which basically means moving your your limbs, so your either your arms or your legs, while keeping your core tight and keeping your spine stable. Um, you know, when we walk, when we run, when we jump, is when our when our core is turned on, but we're moving from our limbs. We're not moving from our core. So you're going to be much much stronger with your core in a stable position rather than having it moving back and forth. So that sums up core training. All right. So after core training, we're going to move into our strength training or our metabolic resistance training. So here is where we would pair up. So I'll give a, an example of a superset. So most of the time for beginners, I'll start with six exercises in pairings of two. So we'll do a superset of a squat, and then we'll do directly after that, we'll do a push-up. For, you know, normally starting off, we'll start out with two to three sets of 15 to 20 repetitions. So after we finish those two to three sets for that squat and that uh, push-up, then we're going to move on to our next exercises. Maybe we'll pair a lunge with a row. So the same thing, we're going to do two to three sets of 15 to 20 repetitions of the lunge, then moving on to the row, resting at the end, and then going on so on and so forth. And then we'll do the same thing for a third. So the third one, so if we're doing maybe do a, a, a supine hip extension, and we'll do another pushing exercise, maybe an overhead press. So we're, again, we're combining the upper and lower body, which we're going to burn more calories uh, throughout the workout session. Um, from our strength training, we're going to move on to metabolic conditioning. So our metabolic conditioning, we can use um, the bike mode. We can use the treadmill. We can use that same um, example that we did prior. We won't have to do the warm-up because we're, you know the warm-up is being you know done throughout the strength training. So after you're done with your strength training, you can go on to the bike. You can go onto the treadmill and perform some, uh, you know, a running interval, or, or sometimes we can use such a thing as a, a kettlebell, or we can use body weight exercises for time. So I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with a squat thrust, or or it's called, sometimes called a burpee. We can do those exercises, and we can do that for time. So if we're going to do a set of burpees, which is uh, for 30 seconds, that's going to be metabolically. Uh, taxing on the body. So we can do that for 30 seconds and then we can use our 60 seconds of active recovery, whether we're walking around, um, whether you know you do a march in place, but something that's not going to be strenuous so that when we go into that burpee again, we're going to be able to give a full effort. So a lot of times uh, what will happen is um, fitness enthusiasts will, will not want to rest and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we that we rest so that when we go into that interval or that high intensity period, we can give our full effort. If we go into that high intensity period, we're not rested enough, we're not able to give our full effort, we're gonna burn less calories. Um, so that's our, uh, an example of our metabolic condition that we could do at the end. We can also use uh, an exercise called kettlebell swings. There's various ways we can set up this metabolic conditioning and, and, and normally um, this will take usually 10 minutes at the end of your workout, we can also you sometimes uh, we'll call it a finisher, something to finish you off uh, on your workout, um, and you know make you really sweat at the end of the workout. Um, lastly, is going to be our cool down. So our cool down uh, we can be used with uh, static stretching. The reason why we want to make sure we want to cool down is cooling down from the workout will. Uh, decrease blood pressure, decrease your resting heart rate. So going from a high intensity uh, exercise such as metabolic conditioning or interval training, and then running straight out of the gym is not going to be detrimental. Uh, it's not going to be beneficial for you. I don't recommend it. I recommend you doing a proper cool down of 
now we can add in some of the static stretching of tight muscles um, at the end of your workout um, now that you're, you're, you're kind of in relaxed mode. So we want to relax the muscles that were just worked, um, increase in the length on you know, tight muscles from the hip flexors, the chest, um, just two areas that are mostly tight in pretty much everybody in our society just because of how much we sit, how much we do everything in front of us. All right. Conclusion. So conclusion is we want to find motivation. So again, we want to find something that's going to motivate us, uh, whether it be a beach vacation, whether it be a family reunion. Find something that's going to light a spark underneath you and really motivate you to accomplish your goal. Um, set a goal and set a deadline. Be very, very specific. If you don't know exactly where you want to go, you cannot lay out a plan to achieve it. Um, so the plan comes from your process goals. So your process goals will be your plan. So if you're getting two interval training and two strength training uh, workouts per week, again, having a little bit of protein with each meal, make sure you're getting adequate rest, which is extremely, uh, uh, it's extremely important for fat loss, making sure you get enough rest. So sleeping between seven and, and nine hours, if you're not getting enough rest, you're going to be increasing a hormone called cortisol. Uh, so um, the hormone called cortisol uh, increases your stomach fat. So that's where your, your, your hormone will increase. Look at your nutrition guidelines. Don't be try to do everything, be the hero and try to do everything at once. Change one nutrition habit at a time. Do it for two weeks, own it, and then move on to the next one. So one at a time, I recommend it very, very highly so that you don't get too much too soon and then you know do good for a little while and then kind of taper off because it was you know it was too much you took on too much at once um, strength training is extremely extremely important for fat loss um, you know building lean muscle uh, help uh, is extremely important um, interval training with that high with your high intensity and low intensity is also extremely uh, important not to say that aerobic training uh, does not work for fat loss. It's just not the most efficient way to go about training for fat loss. So if you're somebody that can only get into the gym, say, two or three times a week, you're going to want to do your strength training and you're going to do your interval training afterwards because you won't have the time to go onto the treadmill or go onto a piece of cardio equipment for that 45 to 60 minutes. Um, it's just too time consuming. And especially... Um, nowadays with people, you know, everybody's busy. Uh, we want to get into the gym and want to get out and we want to use the most effective tools to get you the fastest results possible. And then rinse and repeat. So set out your schedule. Everything we have, we have, uh, in, in our guidelines from, from nutrition, from on a daily basis, you know, having your, your goal, uh, strength training, interval training, rinse and repeat. Be consistent with it is the most important thing. If you set out a plan and you set out something to do is be consistent, be, be consistent and be patient. It's not going to, you know, if you gained 20 pounds or 30 pounds over, over, you know, a short period of time and you've had that same 20 or 30 pounds over the past four years, do not expect it to come off in 10 days. There are things that you can do to accelerate it which I you know, have listed here with the strength training, with interval training, with the, the guidelines that give you with the nutrition. But be patient and stick with it. All right, so a little uh, self-promotion on the last page here, my services. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm a, the personal training director at Core Fitness in Closer, New Jersey. Each one of my training sessions, I work with between one and four people at the same time. So it's not set up as like a group class. Each person has their own individual goals and has their own individual program that I monitor throughout the throughout the, the hour. So basically, they're paying between say forty five and fifty dollars for the session, as opposed to if you do if you did private, which is between eighty and one hundred dollars per session. So it's much more feasible for the client. And also, what I found was is the clients get get far better results because. When they come in, they're accountable also not only to me, but they're also accountable to their two or other two or three other training partners that are with them that day. I've had clients that, you know, just matched up on just because their schedules worked out, didn't know each other, you know, 
from a hole in the wall, and now they're best friends. They're sharing, um, they're sharing recipes. They're sharing uh, things that work for them, things that didn't work for them. So it builds that social support. One of the big things with training for fat loss is having a, a, a support group that are that like-minded and and achieving uh, similar goals. Um, you can contact me if you're you know if you're in the closer area. Um, at my web at uh, my email here, Ericello M1 at yahoo.com. Also, so next thing that I'm very, very excited about, um, which I've been wanting to do, uh, and it's just coming into fruition now, is my online coaching program. Um, so basically, my online coaching program uh, came about with, with people wanting, you know, me to write them programs, me to write them, uh, you know, nutrition plans. Um, this is something that will keep you accountable. So basically, I write you a full training program, and each training program has every exercise that I give you from warm up to cool down has an exercise of me performing an exercise video. So you'll know correct uh, correct form. Um, there's also coaching cues on there, things to watch out for for certain exercises to perform that correctly. You also get uh, a full nutrition plan. Um, with the, with those guidelines that, that I that I uh, gave in this presentation, also you know sample uh, meal plans, uh, a recipe book, um, something that's going to give you the most bang for your buck for your nutrition plan to, to help you succeed. And with this, uh, you, you're going to have unlimited email support. So any questions you have um, with your program, with your training, with your nutrition, really on anything lifestyle. You know, you're having trouble. You know, getting uh, you know enough sleep. What can we do to to support that? I'm there for unlimited support. So you can email me at any time, and within 24 hours, I will answer your emails. Um, right now, it's it's going to be a pre-sale. We're starting for $99 per month. It is going to be a three-month quick commitment. So three months is the quote-unquote amount of time that you can give. To achieve a, a significant result, so you can lose about anywhere from 20, 30 pounds in three months. The reason why I have a three-month commitment is one to make you committed. So if you just do it for a month and then you and then you kind of slack off, I can, you can be under my supervision for those three months so that I make sure that you get the results in, in three months. Um, you can contact me if you're interested in that at matt at mattarkello.com. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, it's one o'clock and people are starting to sign off. So um, if you can, you're all going to get a copy of this PowerPoint. We're going to post it. Um, as you see, he, um, Matt does have his online coaching program. He also has a blog and a YouTube channel um, and a Facebook fan page. So if you could like him there, that would be great. Um, a few questions came in a little late, so um, we will also answer those and send them back, send the answers back. And if anybody has any questions of, for Matt, they can email him Absolutely. or they can email me and I will forward them to Matt. So and I hope you all enjoyed the presentation today. And we want to thank Matt for coming in and doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your guys' uh, attention. And any, like Sharon said, any questions you may have, you can send over to my email and I'd be happy to answer any questions that we had with the presentation.